Bob Gober, who, as I mentioned, curated the Birchfield exhibition, is one of the foremost sculptors of his generation. And in addition to making his own work, he's also curated several exhibitions, including the very important um, Meat Wagon exhibition at the Menil in Houston. Donna DeSalvo is a major tour de force in the art world. She's the chief curator at the Whitney, and I believe she's the first chief curator they've ever had there. Um, she, before that, she was a senior curator at the Tate Modern in London. And she's also curated major, major exhibitions at the Wexner and at our own MOCA and the Andy Warhol Museum. And she's written innumerable catalogs and essays. So we're very pleased to have both of them here today. Please join me in welcoming Bob Gober and Donna DeSalvo. And Claudia, thank you for that lovely introduction. We're really uh, delighted to be here to uh, talk to you, to, for, for Bob and I to talk to each other, and, uh, and to talk about curating Birchfield, a variety of different things. So I thought we'd just sort of uh, establish the parameters of what we're going to be talking about. And uh, it's a bit of a hybrid, I think, in a sense, because we're going to talk about curating um, from a variety of perspectives. Um, and inevitably, we'll speak also about Charles Birchfield and the different uh, impacts, uh, the impact of, uh, of the, in a sense, what a curator also brings to an interpretation of an artist. And I think it'll be a very lively discussion given that uh, I'm a curator, Bob is a curator, uh, and he's also an artist. So we have a, that's why I mean the hybrid. But I, I think we're gonna get into an interesting history, I think, too, about uh, uh, maybe this not being such a, uh, unusual thing in a sense in terms of the history of curating and artists serving as uh, curators before this profession ever came into being. Um, so Bob, I know we want to talk really beginning about some of your early uh, ventures as a curator, which mm -hmm. really begin with the, uh, we, I believe, 1989 exhibition at the ICA uh, in Boston and then going up through to the exhibition Meat Wagon in 2005 at uh, Menil Collection, of course, and then coming to your most recent uh, exhibition project. Yeah. I thought we'd focus on Meat Wagon and then on, on Birchfield. And for those of you who don't know the uh, about the Menil, it's a museum that's only been in existence, I think it's just 20 years now, although it feels like such an integral part of the um, American and international art landscape. And it was founded by two individuals, John and Dominique de Menil. They, uh, were French, they were in exile uh, during the Nazi occupation, came to New York. Her um, father and his brother founded Schlumberger, which is a company that makes equipment to extract oil from the soil. Oil from the soil. Um, uh, from New York, they went to Caracas uh, because of oil and then, because her husband was running the company and then settled in Houston in the, in the 50s. And they were in, first encouraged to collect art. They had no idea about collecting art. Neither, neither came from a background or a family that did this. But they were in, when they were in exile in New York, there was also a French priest there at the same time, Father Couturier. And uh, Father Couturier's life's mission was, he was a, a Roman Catholic priest. And his life's mission was trying to reconnect the Catholic Church with great living artists. And probably the largest, most famous project he was responsible for is Matisse's Chapel in Vents. But they were friends and they were in New York and he, that's when he convinced them, he called it their moral duty to collect art, uh, both contemporary art and art of all kinds of different ages. And they assembled uh, an amazing collection of art that was then put into the repository of the Menil Collection, which is a gorgeous Renzo Piano building in uh, the Montrose section of Houston. And the collection ranges from, uh, I think the earliest object is circa 20,000 BC up to really up, up to the present. And it's everything from, from Western fine art, from a, a terrific Warhol, Barnett, Newman, John's collection, to uh, Etruscan art, Cycladic art, medieval art, um, I don't think there's any folk art. There's a huge collection, they have a huge collection of uh, black memorabilia. There's ordinary objects. 
Um, but as I, as I, I was invited by the, the curator at the time there, Matthew Drutt, to curate from the collection. And it was his idea to com that I combine my work with works from the collection. And I didn't really like the idea, but I, I thought that if I said yes, I could finagle some way to <laughs> do what I wanted and not what he wanted. But when I got into the collection, I saw what he was seeing, which were the connections between some themes in my work and some themes in the collection. Because even though the collection was so wide ranging, there, there were these threads that ran through it. Um, their Catholicism, their interest in surrealism, uh, their interest in race, and their interest in the everyday object. And those were definitely themes that are uh, in my work. Mm -hmm. So I think we can start yeah, the slides. Yeah, I think slides. we have some slides. Uh, the first slide, when I, I, the first thing I did at the Menil was I, I went down to the Menil and um, I spent about six weeks there in one week periods because they, they have about 5,000 objects, um, which is not a whole lot, but it's not a whole little either. And um, my idea was that I wanted to see each object uh, itself. And I was able to do that except for unmatted photographs, which were too fragile to handle. And so I looked at those in reproduction. Then I would come back to my studio in New York, and I would, uh, I would make um, small-scale maquettes of the things I was interested in and try making arrangements of them. And so this is a maquette in my studio that's maybe this big across. Next slide. You can see my age by calling them slides. <laughs> um, and then this would be the drawing that I would make from that, that then I would send to the Menil that would have their, their uh, code numbers for where it is and what it is within the collection. And next slide. And then this is the uh, exhibition itself. And they tend to hew pretty closely to, the exhibitions tend to hew pretty closely to what I've worked out in the maquettes. And that was also true for Birchfield um, mm. upstairs. I mean, cer certain rooms, I didn't know exactly where things would go, but, the, but they didn't migrate from room to room. But how did you come about the concept for this? I mean, there's so many objects at Menil. What then, and, and you weren't doing a survey, what was the framework then that you evolved? The, well, how, 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 I think my interest got started there and how I got a beat on what I might like to, to do was uh, the storage at the Menil is somewhat famous in that it is available to be seen. You have to know somebody or make an appointment, but they've hung everything salon style, so it's exposed. So you can go there and not just see the exhibitions, but you can see everything that's in storage, supposedly. The first thing I found when they got there is that there's storage and then there's storage. <laughs> and so I went into the storage, which is like ordinary storage. It's like stuff in the basement that's like been wrapped up and nobody's seen it for years and it's floor to ceiling. And I found stuff down there that the Menil had never shown. Like, uh, let's go to five. She collected oxen yokes. Um, she collected ordinary objects. And I could start to see like why she collected oxen yokes. To me, they had a great, um, they were great supporters of the underdog. And that's how I saw the, the yoke as like a beast, mm. uh, an mm. artifact from Beast of Burden. For mm. instance, they also on this same shelf were slave shackles that they, that they collected in bills of sales of slaves, which I did not show. Uh, let's back up to four. Does that start to address yes, what you're? Yes. Yeah. So that's where I started, was in, was in the basement. And then this was a sculpture of mine that went on that wall, which is children's legs that form a, a, a that become burning logs in a fireplace. And then the, there's like prison bars that are bent open in a, a classic expression of escape. Uh, to six, please. This was another object in the basement. This is when I started to know that I had a show, when I saw things like this, because I thought it would be kind of revelatory. And they had a, a deep interest in, they were mortified when they got to Houston and saw how segregated it was mm -hmm. and saw how the races were treated so differently. And um, this, this was, um, this piece was a reflection of that. I felt a responsibility to the Menils to, to represent, um, a lot of the aspects of their, of their deep interests. And this was also a beautiful object. Nobody knows, I think it came from a wax museum in, uh, 
in, in Kansas City. Seven. And this, I should read it. I'll have to set up this different term. Uh, President Richard Nixon, during your administration, the retail price of meat has skyrocketed. During your administration, the technology of slaughtering and roasting has been sophisticated. During your administration, would you believe no humans were killed in Vietnam? It is unfortunate the meat is rotting in the fields. Technology must overcome to fulfill the American dream. Eat what you kill. And this was from the uh, guerrilla art action group, uh, John Hendricks and Jean Touche. Uh, this was a work of art that I had never seen anywhere. Um, and that's what I kind of got interested in the Manil, is showing things that hadn't been seen, whether they were ancient or they were contemporary. And by putting this next to, let's go to number eight. Next to Lincoln, I was able to start um, uh, making a dialogue, uh, an American dialogue across the ages. Now, I mean, one of the things that this shows in this particular project is the way in which meaning is, is constructed through uh, uh, the dialogues that you set up. So unlike, let's say, with Birchfield, where there's a development within Birchfield's work that you then uh, examine, and that le begins to create its own structure as a result, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in this instance, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, one could shuffle this deck very differently Absolutely. with the same objects yeah. and come up with a completely different meaning. Yeah, this was more like poetry. And Birchfield, it was more like telling a story. Mm. The narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nine. Did we go there? I'm just going to show some other things that were in the show. Uh, they had a beautiful suite of Delacroix drawings. I felt like I had to express their Frenchness in, in a certain way. Uh, number 10. Uh, this is circa uh, 1850, a, a liberationist potholder. Any, any holder but a slaveholder. They have a, a huge collection of black memorabilia, which by its nature is oftentimes racist, but uh, I decided to show things, and there were a considerable number that were not um, in, a, in, in any way that celebrated, um, celebrated race. Uh, and I thought this was an amazing object, and also something never been seen. Uh, 11. Here's a, another wall in that room. There's an Eggleston photo on the left. They have a huge photography collection and had a, a deep relationship with Eggleston. If I'm not mistaken, they might own every photograph that he, that he had made up until the time that Dominique died. Um, in, the, in the middle is a, a suite of drawings by an artist named Charles Howard. Uh, number 12. Uh, Char Charles Howard was an artist who lived in San Francisco, and he had a close friend who was a curator named Douglas McGaggy. And uh, in 1944, uh, McGaggy uh, contracted tuberculosis before there was a, um, uh, an effective method for treating it. They would send you to a sanitarium. Sanatorium or terium? Sanatorium. <laughs> Sanatorium. Sanitarium. Anyway. Sanitarium. He, he, and they didn't expect him to survive or to get out. So Charles Howard, for every day he was there, he sent him a drawing. And the drawings were on business-sized paper. And when you see them in person, they're folded in three, put in a business envelope. And they were called uh, Drawings to an Absent Friend. And it was every day for almost two months. And when um, McGaggy died, he ended up surviving because they, kept, they, they developed streptomycin. And uh, he survived for, for a good bit of time. But when he died, he left them to his wife, who was Germaine McGaggy. Yes. And then she left them to the Menil. Well, Germaine McGaggy was a very inf uh, an extraordinary influence on Mrs. De Menil. And um, if you go to the Menil bookstore, you may still find actually some extraordinary catalogs that she did in the 50s, late 40s and into the 50s. She was very close with many artists, worked closely with Rothko, and in a sense learned a lot from artists. So it, 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 she's really, you know, it's very interesting thinking about Menil because it's a very 
distinctive kind of organization in the way that it operates. It, it's not bound by the same sort of, uh, chrono I would say, chronological presentations or categorizations. It's a very inspired, as you know, personal collection. And for instance, the fact that they collected uh, uh, abstract expressionism and Northwest Coast Indian art, looking at the influences, displayed them together, which would not be the standard way in which museums would work. But Jermaine McGeggy uh, did extraordinary exhibitions that when you look back now seem incredibly inspired and blur that line. But this is where I think the whole practice of curating has changed dramatically over yeah. many, many years, became rather scientific almost. And then perhaps now, well, the past number of years, we've been in a, a much more liberated state mm -hmm. in terms of what curators feel uh, able to do. And a lot of that has to do with artists and the permission that, you know, and I go back yeah. and think of Raid the Icebox mm -hmm. that Warhol did at yeah. the Menil Collection. And yeah. he was invited by Mrs. Demenil, staged the works at the Rhode Island School of Design. Yeah. And it's interesting when you talk about seeing works in the, um, in the storeroom, because that's what Warhol did then. He showed the works as they had appeared in crates. So he wanted mm -hmm. to show the museum inside out, a sort of warts and all type approach. Yep. So that's why the Menil and you were, were a perfect fit in that yep. sense. Uh, 13, please. I'm going to show four of those um, Charles Howard drawings. I think I did a grid of just 12. And it was actually John de Menil who had the idea for Warhol to do Raid the Icebox. Oh, it came from him yeah. and not Mr. Demenil. Yeah, ah. because um, John Demenil died in, I think, 72, mm -hmm. and she lived so much longer, yes. and she was so charismatic. She just died like six or seven years ago that I think people assume that the museum was her, and it was really uh, both, both of them together. Like one extraordinary um, story that I learned is that in the 60s when Warhol was just starting to make his films, John de Menil, who was a devout Catholic, had the concept to make a chapel. It would have been in San Antonio. And all he wanted for the art on the walls of the chapel were Warhol's films. And Warhol came up with the, it's amazing. It's mm. amazing. I mean, because for me, it takes me a long time to sort out contemporary art and what's being made at the moment. But John de Menil had a clairvoyance about what was being made at the moment that was beyond beyond. Um, what Warhol envisioned were real-time films of a sunrise and a sunset. And the project, I don't know why, never happened. It only came out in print. Well, it, exi it, ex it does exist as a film, ultimately. It yeah. was finally made as a film. And the prints, which are actually rather extraordinary because there are 800 of them, but they're all unique silk screens. Well. I mean, but that's that you know that was the genius of Jean de Menil and yeah. uh, understanding and really being receptive in that way. Yeah, uh, fourteen, which appears to be a man, woman, in a tub, and uh, f <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're fantastic drawings. Oh, and they weren't known; they had never been shown. So this was, this to me was the exciting stuff that I uh, that I was unearthing. So in, what was the response Menil. within Menil, uh, the Menil collection, to your showing some things that hadn't been shown before? Okay. Here was the other pivotal thing that I had to do, aside from look at the work. I had to gain the trust of the longtime people at the Menil because at that time there were four people who had worked with the Menils, one person over forty years, and the rest. 30, 30 something years, and they had a, a deep attachment. Because even though the museum's only been open 20 years, they worked with her mm. 20 years before that on the collection, cataloging it when she was a curator at Rice University and before that at St. Thomas University. And once I, they were very suspicious of me, what was I going to do? And uh, once I gained their trust, it was gravy. It was them that would lead me to things. And to give you an example of the type of relationship that these employees had, um, a man named Bear was the um, head preparator and had been for almost 40 years. And he built both of their coffins when they died. Mm. And hers was built in the shop, in the of, shop. of the museum. Yeah. Uh, 16. Oh, no, 15, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, this, I think. It, is it? It's like looking out from inside your own head as you're about to feed yourself. <laughs> it's, it's something like that. I thought they were extra, extraordinary. Okay, 16. 
they are the big collectors of surrealism and especially Magritte. They had a pattern, they would buy one Magritte painting a year. And they had a dealer in New York who was looking out for them and would offer one great painting. I think this is called The Survivor. And it's a painting of a bloody gun. And underneath it on the floor is a sculpture of a gin bottle uh, that I made about almost 10 years ago now. Because I always think there's a relationship between uh, alcohol and violence. 17. Uh, this is a Michelangelo Pistoletto from 1965 called Vietnam, painted on polished stainless steel. And on the floor next to it is 18, um, a small beat up uh, box that held one of the many models of the Rothko Chapel. And the Rothko Chapel is, is on the same campus as, as the museum. But I wanted to somehow, but it's such a famous thing that they created there and such a big part of what they did that I wanted to bring it into the installation in some way. And I did it by bringing in this crummy box that had been taped and cut open and taped and cut open. You said that now that that is... Um... It's now considered a sort of semi-object part of the collection <laughs> because, it's, because, because it's been shown. Um, but do you think in the end that what... what you did was to create a, uh, to me it's a kind of self-portrait, uh, or it's a portrait of, of, of the Menil collection as seen through your eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's a double portrait. Mm -hmm. in a way. I don't know if you agree with that Absolutely. characterization. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. good. We yeah. won't argue on that one. <laughs> <laughs> 19. Uh, I did a, a vitrine, two vitrines, of uh, documentation and stuff about Father Couturier, because I just thought it was so amazing that a, a Roman Catholic priest would encourage you to collect art, and in a really good way. I mean, because, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, and I think in there, let's see, there's a, uh, I can see there's a, I just have a small uh, images here. There's a, a Life magazine feature on the Matisse Chapel and uh, 20. A big pile of um, Xeroxes of handwritten letters from Matisse to Father Couturier with image and words as he was developing his ideas. And at one point, these were in the possession of the Menils, and then they decided to give them to Yale, which has Father Couturier's, um, all of his... Uh, Archives. Thank you. Um, and 21, uh, one last image. It's from uh, circa mid-60s. Uh, it was something John de Menil collected. Um, and it was another object from the Black Memorabilia collection. And we kept it wound and ticking through the show. After doing that whole thing, I mean, it's always such an interesting thing as a curator. I, I always feel it's unfortunate that as curators, you have to write your essay before you actually install mm -hmm. the exhibition because it's only after you've installed it that you actually figure it out. Yeah. And I'm just curious, after the whole process of installing this particular exhibition, um, you know, were there things you rethought, things you would have done differently? What, what, was, your, what was your sense at the very end of it all? Um... I was very pleased that so many of the people, I was, I was pleased with it myself, but I was also extraordinarily pleased how receptive the people within the, within the Menil were, from the guards to the, to the old timers. Mm. They seemed to really love the show, and that gave me great satisfaction. Mm. I'm sure a lot of it had to do with the respect with which you approach the material, yeah. as you say, gaining the trust. Well, I, w I went to their graves, literally and introduced myself and told them what I was thinking and asked their permission and told them to wish me well. Oh, my word. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And I think, again, you know, the whole concept of the spiritual nature of the, the relationship with Father Couturier and the whole um, interest that the Menils themselves had in art as a spiritual endeavor uh, you know, it's, it's very key, key to the Rothko Chapel, to the very origins of, of Menil, the Menil collection itself and where it stems from. So it is a very, um, and again, I think the fact that they do not have the same kind of, um, uh, their, their mandate is different because they're a private collection. Right. And one gets into very interesting issues about why sometimes you do certain things in museums that look uh, as if they're heavy-handed or they look as if somehow they are trying to fix meaning. And I think that is, is to me a very, very interesting issue about how not to fix the meaning in a work of art and yet at the same time evolve a narrative 
that brings it forward to a public. Yeah. That, that's the delicate dance you do as a curator. Yeah. You, you had mentioned also wish, um, when the show's over, you, you wish you could write your essay then, mm. once you see yes. it. And so I didn't write an essay for The Meat Wagon. I did an interview with uh, the chief curator, Matthew Drout, and it lasted over a year. We did it by email over the course of a year, and it was about making the show. Mm. So I got away from that problem by approaching it that it's way. a big, it's a big challenge, and it's um, as I say, it's uh, it's sort of it's just a kind of unfortunate situation. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to a curator the other day who said she said I never look back at my catalogs because there's so many things I wished I had said differently or done or done that. differently. Yeah, I can them. understand that. Well, look, the reality is that if you if the art didn't actually have to live in the world, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. But right. you know, when it comes into the gallery, as I'm sure you found with Birchfield, yeah. that things behave in the way they want to behave once you put them together, once they're in the actual space. But that's the joy of art. That's the power of art. And that's also its radicality. Yeah. A lot. Well, with the, with the heat waves and a swamp catalog, I know I could do a much better job now that the show's up and I see it. Well, I yeah. don't know. You better think twice <laughs> about this curatorial thing now, Bob. I don't know. <laughs> to start taking on the... Uh, you know, it is an interesting um, uh, uh, process that one goes through. And, and yes, there are those regrets because at the end of it, you see things that you've never saw before. Um, but then that you bring it on to some other thing, whether it's in your own work, whether it's in your next curatorial project that you right. take on. Yeah. Um, so maybe we should turn to talking about yep. heat waves in a, in a swamp. You know, I have to say one of the questions, I, 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 I know the, there's a, such an interesting story of how this exhibition came about and um, that you've talked about, certainly, of having uh, dinner with Annie uh, Philbin at your house and uh, her remarking on the Birchfield drawings you had in your own home. Um, and really from that, this exhibition uh, uh, stemmed an invitation for you to organize an exhibition of Birchfield. Um, but I, I actually didn't, I've never asked you what led you to get those works by Birchfield to buy them. <laughs> the price was right. You know, <laughs> I think I paid $800 for one of them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to artists who are, um, for one reason or another, uh, neglected, put on the sidelines, um, uh, also, also underdogs. Mm -hmm. and, and then that carries through in terms of maybe what I buy and uh, put on my walls to, to, to live with. And then, see, the, I didn't know much about Birchfield when I, when I bought the drawings. I mean, I had this uh, kind of a working knowledge of him. But then when I buy something by an artist, then I'll start researching the artist and want to find out more. And that um, happened to be the point when Annie came, happened to come by. And I often remark about this, that if another director had come by, I could be doing a very different show mm, because mm. I had just bought a Rosa Bonheur drawing, a, a beautiful drawing of a, of a sleeping dog from the late 1800s. And I started looking into her life and it's fascinating. I mean, she, she, she lived with women, but she lived dressed as a man. She had to get a doctor's approval to do this and how they did it is because she only drew animals, she had to go to slaughterhouses sometimes and there's no female dress for slaughterhouses so she was allowed to dress as a man. She was enormously successful. She lived in a castle surrounded by her private zoo so she could draw them and no one knows her work now. So is that the next show? No, because I, <laughs> no, because I looked into her work and I don't think I'd want to spend that much time with it. <laughs> But it is this, you know, it is an interesting issue about um, then what unfolds in terms of your, uh, your, the responsibility you take on now, and, and particularly given the fact that Birchfield's work is in this very peculiar place, and we can talk more about that, I think, as we, as we, as we move through the slides. Um, I was very struck by, and I re when we spoke about uh, this exhibition at, in its very early uh, stages of organization and uh, thinking about it uh, now traveling to the Whitney, I remember you talking about this catalog cover and the back of the cover. And, um, I, I, you know, the front of the cover, which is a cat, one of his, cat his camouflage images, which is really quite atypical in a sense uh, to uh, include uh, to uh, on the front of the catalog. Tell mm -hmm. me a bit about how you even made that decision. And then we'll get to the back of the catalog. Right. Well, it seemed, to me, it seemed obvious in an intuitive way. And I, I mean, that's my job, is to trust my intuition. Um, 
Uh, I thought it. I thought it bridged. I mean, I can. I can logically talk about it. That I think it bridged like a, a, a pure, a pure pictorial interest and a, a functional interest because it was made as camouflage. Mm. And I could also see how the shapes that that haunt it and inhabit it are the same shapes that he used within his work. Mm. And I thought it would be good to put something that was completely unknown and unexpected on the cover of Birchfield rather than a classic, what, what you might know as a classic mm. uh, Birchfield painting, to get curiosity about like, well, what else and why? And it sort of posed a, a, verb, a visual question. Well, bravo to the hammer for letting you put that on the cover. Um, because I think that, you know, oftentimes what happens is that uh, curators, institutional curators are, we have to work through marketing departments and people review the cover and they want to think, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times, not so, we don't do this so much at the Whitney, thankfully, but other places where, you know, the figurative image will sell, this one will not sell, abstract yeah. images don't sell, this, yeah. so, you know, it's an interesting issue about that level of freedom that you were given, which is, it resulted in, I think, a really fantastic cover for the catalog. I, I, I have had those discussions at other institutions, like red. <laughs> Catches the eye. <laughs> yep. But and it could be Cindy. It could have been Cindy because I was a guest curator and I wasn't um, here that much. And it was really Cindy doing the day to day. And um, no, bravo, Cindy, because that's it was an inspired choice. But the back of the cover is the one that gave me the big, the uh, the, the most pause because in it you chose to have a a an article about Birchfield and his success as an ex at an exhibition. But then um, the rather perverse inclusion of um, artist honored home robbed. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about that sure, decision? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, Birchfield died unexpectedly in 1967. He had a lot of ailments, but he died suddenly of a heart attack. And exactly one month before the fatal heart attack, he opened, or the State University of New York in Buffalo opened the Birchfield Center, which is still there and who we worked with to make this exhibition. And so 30 days before he died, there was a big opening of this uh, place. And at the top of this article, above the fold, is um, Birchfield in a tuxedo and his wife in a gown. And there's this huge full page article from the Buffalo Evening News about what a big deal this is and how happy we all are. And then in the middle of it was that article. And it came to me already outlined. I had bought on eBay an old catalog of Birchfields from the uh, Buffalo area, and somebody had um, folded in this, uh, this annotated article, and, and um, I, just, I just loved it. Um, and, and Birchfield, in his writings, he, um, he talked about, he was famous during, during his lifetime, especially in the 30s, uh, and he talked about his fame as a prison, and talked about, he sort of rued the reality that you have to exhibit your work in order to um, continue to make it, because you have to exhibit it so it becomes appreciated, so that people buy it. And he was kind of bitter about this whole thing. He valued his time in his studio, and he didn't seem to me, he was acutely aware of his position within, say, art history, if you can see such a thing, and you kind of can't. but. Um, but he didn't need a lot from, from people. And so it was that kind of metaphor of fame as a prison that I thought Birchfield would appreciate in the artist honored home robbed. Because mm, there is yeah. something true about that metaphor. Okay, we have the next slide. Oh yeah, 23. You better talk about this. Oh yes, well I asked for this slide to be included so I guess I should speak about it. Well I was very struck because this is a page from the catalog and it has uh, a, a a page from Birchfield's journals, journals right. with your uh, annotations through your post-it notes. Uh, and, uh, and obviously the title itself came from uh, your looking at this. You know, it's a revealing of process and it really is, it, to me it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's very uh, uh, revealing in a sense in terms of your decision to put that in the catalog. Now, I as a curator would not put that in the catalog. Now, maybe I'm wrong and I should put it in the catalog, but when you do things like that, it raises interesting questions about the decision to do that because this is where, um, you know, th this exhibition, unlike the meat wagon, does not include 
any work of your own in it. Almost. But we'll get to well, that. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. But it, it's, it's I not. I did worry about it, that it was too self referential mm. and maybe a, a bit of a vanity page in, in, in the book. Well, mm. I think that you can't, es you can't escape being Bob Gober. And that's a real, and that you, you know, you bring your own history to it, and as does anyone. But then there's an, you know, inevitably, I'm assuming you, you, you came to terms with the fact that inevitably people are going to look at the connections between your work and um, Birchfield's work. And mm -hmm. you, you know, I've already asked you a few mm -hmm. um, points we've come to. So I think it's fantastic that you mm -hmm. have that in there. I, I mean, I like it very much. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but, and I like that it's different. I don't yeah. think things should be all the same. But, it, but, but it, I wonder if a professional curator had done it, if you'd have the same reaction or if I, or if I would. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I have a colleague who uh, is a fantastic conservator, Carol Mancusi-Angaro, and she often has, uh, likes to do things where she uh, will reproduce her own notes with, with uh, 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 annotated. Mm -hmm. And she's done it in, some, in a catalog, but mm -hmm. got tremendous pushback about doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, because she is a conservator and really is an unusual person because she has such a great engagement with process, um, it sort of slips in there. I don't know, it's an interesting issue. I'll have to think about that for the next project I do, uh, whether or not it makes sense to do. It does reveal something, though, about the fact that there is someone who makes decisions behind an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the critical thing, is that we're not talking about the, uh, the you know, narrator as God, the, the right. unnamed individual. The reality is every exhibition that is organized is a subjective view, and the next curator will do it differently. Right. So revealing that, it's like debate within some museums, does the name of the curator go on the wall? Some museums, yes, some museums, no. You know, do you reveal that? So I think it does reveal the fact that, you know, there is an individual who has made decisions here that impact how we will now see Charles Birch Field. Yeah, I didn't think about it before, but I'm wondering now, because um, if, if I didn't have a, a doubt about being taken seriously in the sense of someone who would really do the research in his homework, and it wasn't somewhat a small nod to that. Mm. Interesting. Okay. 24. Now, you made a decision also, um, this is the beginning of the exhibition, really, which is the, the um, uh, conventions for a abstract thoughts, thoughts um, which were the works that he made around 1917, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and you made a decision to do the installation chronologically. Mm -hmm. Was that a clear point from the very beginning for you? Yes, it, yeah, it was. Because I had to make sense of this guy's life and his work, and I had to thus make sense of it for other people. And it seemed like the in terms of, te I, I had a responsibility to tell a story about him. And so that in that way, it made perfect sense mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. to go chronologically. Well, why don't you walk us through these a bit? Because I think they're very, um, in a way, they set the stage for his entire artistic career. Yeah, these were drawings that were very important to him. Uh, the, in the vitrine, you can maybe see he, um, he assembled, he assembled, he was an incredible archivist of his own work and he had put all these drawings into handmade notebooks that he made, and luckily his dealers were never able to sell any of them, and so for the first time we were able to bring them all back together in the show. And in um, 1917, he was still living in Salem, Ohio. He was born in 1893 in Ashtabula, Ohio. Um, a little biography here, maybe? Mm, sure. Um, uh, one of six kids, his father died, when he was just a small kid, and so the mother took the kids back to her hometown, which was Salem, Ohio, thinking that she was gonna to to split them up with relatives in order to survive. But he had two bachelor uncles. Um, I'm a bachelor uncle. A <laughs> shout out to bachelor uncles. <laughs> and uh, the bachelor uncles pooled their money and uh, bought a house uh, for the Birchfields, and the kids never knew, but they were allowed to live there uh, uh, rent free. So he was about 24 when he, he made these drawings, uh, still living at home, although he had already gone to the, into the service into the Cleveland Institute of Art for four years where he had a scholarship. And he was uh, recovering from a failed uh, relation, romantic relationship. And he did this series of drawings where he was trying to 
um, make forms that he called conventions, forms that he would use over and over again that were mostly abstract, in some cases mm -hmm. semi-abstract, and that um, keyed into moods. Now, most of them have words on them, and most, most of Donna particularly liked Im imbecility <laughs> was one. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> it's just a great And they're one. most kind of dark, brooding kind of words that he used. And anyway, these images recur continually. Through, uh, through his work. In fact, in the camouflage, you can see them in there. The camouflage was the next year, and they came back even in that. And they especially come back in the last room of the exhibit in his much later work. Well, I mean, I think one of the revelations of this group of material was that, um, you know, it, the, in 1955, John Bauer at the Whitney actually did a major touring exhibition of Birchfield. The first retrospective. First Birchfield. retrospective. And in his catalog essay, um, he actually talks about there being three Birchfields in the, in that, in the book. First, he said, is the, the, the young clerk at the W.H. Mullins Company in Salem, Ohio, who just returned from four years at the Cleveland School of Art and was painting small watercolors. The second was... Uh, a Birchfield in 1942, fa married father of five, living in a frame house in Buffalo, who'd left his wallpaper job and had, had achieved some national reputation for realist works. And then the third is the one living at that point in Gardenville today and will be 63. And Bauer was specifically addressing what he thought was the overlooked aspects of Birchfield's work. One was the extraordinary romantic quality of it. And to an extent, really showing the way in which Birchfield uh, uh, was never an American regionalist painter. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, the idea of going back or to the beginning, which for Birchfield himself was, as you show later in the exhibition, uh, was a, a great source for him yeah. to revisit, um, uh, is, was, was a very important one. I also curious too, though, about the, the discussions of Birchfield and abstraction. That um, I know he has he said that he felt that he was not part of any kind of abstract school. He didn't like being part of any school, whether it was regionalism or American scene painting, um, uh, and and he was uh, also almost all his life suspicious of abstraction that wasn't derived from nature. But I, I do often, I do wonder in thinking about it what, uh, I mean, obviously he was not naive about what was going on. His teacher, I believe, had shown in the 1913 Armory Exhibition and, in, and presumably encouraged these abstract works. Uh, y yeah, we don't know that much about, we do know he was exposed um, to what was going on. I don't think he was ever naive. I think he was one of these people or one of these artists who would appear to be naive, but actually was extraordinarily clever all throughout his life at meeting the right people at the right time who could advance his career. Mm, mm, I think he maybe mm. hid behind a, a veneer of, uh, of naivete. Mm, mm, mm. Which, was, which then, in a sense, is how people began to characterize his work, even to this day. Yeah. I mean, I think this exhibition teaches us a lot about yeah. who Birchfield was and the accomplishments of his work. And he never lived within an art center. You know, after Ohio, he moved to Buffalo, which we'll talk about. And he lived in, outside of Buffalo in a suburb called Gardenville. And he lived there for 50 years. But he would go to New York every year. He had shows, uh, always had a New York dealer from 19, well, actually from the late teens. And uh, every year he was on the uh, the board of the uh, Guggenheim Foundation to give grants to two visual artists and also the American Academy in Rome. And you do that on a panel with your peers and you see a lot of stuff that comes before you. So he, he had to have been aware of quite a bit. Mm, mm. You know. Well, I think actually the next um, 25? slides, yes, bring us in fact yeah. to his exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, curated by Alfred Barr. Yep, MoMA opened in 20, 1929, and about six months later uh, did their first one-person exhibition, which was uh, Charles Birchfield, Watercolors. It was 1930, but it was watercolors from this period of 1916 to 18 that were uh, in the show. And to the best of our ability, we've created, recreated that exact show upstairs. And in the vitrines, as you can see in the image, on the right is the uh, orange MoMA catalog. Uh, above, oh, I'll get to that. Now, above it is a letter from Birchfield to Alfred Barr. 
and, uh, and then there's a big scrapbook with clippings from the show. His wife was the um, ultimate artist's wife in a good sense. She was um, his archivist, his gatekeeper, his friend, his best critic, his supporter. Um, and she kept these huge notebooks all throughout his career, pasted it in, handwritten by her what they were. And he would go through it. And if he, say, disagreed with a critic's reception, he'd write his comments in the, um, in the border of this. So we have it open to the, the 1930 page. Um, and interestingly, uh, MoMA does not acknowledge this as their first one-person exhibition, even though technically it was. They say that it was Henri Matisse in 1932. Mm. But this is, a, this is an interesting point. I mean, MoMA's, one of MoMA's early acquisitions was housed by a railroad uh, by Hopper, which equally is, I don't believe, acknowledged as the first. Right. And the whole attitude towards American modernism, um, which is now changing, I think, in, mm -hmm. in how Museum of Modern Art is displaying their collection, but there was certainly a bias against it. And Birchfield, as a result, I think, in a sense, th that Barr had some, you know, Barr was much more intuitive than people give him credit for, mm -hmm. um, and certainly much more open in how he looked at things. Right. Um, I, you know, I think that Birchfield was a modernist, mm -hmm. an American modernist, mm -hmm. and we can come to that a little bit more about why he was an American modernist, because I think that's what your exhibition r really taught me, mm -hmm. was to understand what made him an American can modernist. Can you say more? Well, I think that there's, you know, it's interesting to think about all the influences that were in the air at that time, and whether it's the 1917 period or the later period. I think there's something, though, fundamental about his connection to nature and to the landscape that is very distinctly American, a kind of individual perspective, if you will, that you'd see the beginning, you see it in the, uh, the, the love of nature, even in the abstract expressionist. You see it in Pollock in that way. It plays out differently. The difference, of course, with Birchfield is he never gives up the relationship to figuration. He, he right. never gives that up. I mean, it means something to him in some way. And I don't entirely understand I understand that. I mean, you, you will probably have far greater insight to that than I do. But I think that there is something distinctly American about this, the, the romantic quality of his work. And that yeah. tradition as it exists within American painting, certainly. There was a great show many years organized uh, ago by um, uh, Kiniston McShine called Painting in the Natural Paradise that mm -hmm. really ab attempted to trace the lineage actually going back to Hudson River landscape yep. uh, works. And you look at the, er, you know, those, those that, the love of that work by people like, you know, Dan Flavin. So I think that's it. But the structure and the mm -hmm. interest in abstraction and, and some degree of abstract language, however he wanted to call it, is there. There's a sophistication in that sense. Mm. Anyway, that's a... It's interesting. 26. Uh, this is a close-up of the letter to Alfred Barr from uh, Birchfield, which basically says, I heard the show look great. Sorry, I couldn't get to, down to see it. <laughs> which I, I just, I have a perverse nature, so I, I just love that. But MoMA wasn't MoMA then, mm -hmm. you know, it was, yeah. six, it, was six, it was six months old. Yeah, but you reveal a lot about Birchfield as, as an individual by including mm -hmm. that, through that inclusion. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that's the power of objects, whether they are art objects or they're archival objects. Uh, you know, I, one could ma write a text panel, you know, uh, ad, that would explain this thing, mm -hmm. and you'd stand there and you read it, but you could never convey it as much as, as brilliantly as just by having the real thing. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's that authenticity that connects the viewer back to that moment in time through the real thing. Yeah. I, I, what I wanted to do is not just present a chronology of his works, but to tell the story of a man. Mm. And so that was part of bringing these objects in to do that. Yes. 27? Okay. So in uh, about 1921, Birchfield was starting a family, and uh, within six years, he had five kids, and he needed a job. And uh, his art teacher recommended that he design wallpaper for the H.M. Burge Company outside in Buffalo. And he moved to Buffalo. He stayed there for 50 years, and he designed wallpaper for nine years. And, um, and he hated every minute of it, didn't he? He did. He, he, he did. And, uh, and the problem was he was good at it. So he kept getting promoted within the company. 
And um, by the end, he was the head of the wallpaper design. It was a big company, high quality wallpaper, and he was head of the design department. And it gave him an anxiety attacks and bleeding ulcers. And with the support of his wife, he quit the job. And he quit it in the summer of 1929. Not, know, not knowing what he was going to do. Although there was a dealer at that time, he'd been showing in, in New York, but wasn't that happy with a gallery called the Montrose Gallery, which showed American modernists. And uh, a, a, a collector who was buying Birchfield's work introduced him to a gallerist named Frank Wren. And Wren said he thought he could sell his work. And Birchfield said, OK. And from, for the next at least two and a half decades, Wren did sell his work. And uh, he ended up, he never had to take a job again. He did a few like summer teaching gigs, but he actually didn't like those. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder what Birchfield himself would have thought about your decision to, inst I mean, I think it's spectacular that room, but I, I wonder yeah. what he would have thought of that. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I got permission from the Birchfield Center, which, um, and they thought that, that it was okay, and that was enough to run with it to see what it would look like. So this is a recreation of a wallpaper that he made in 1921, and we had it uh, reprinted for the exhibition. And then on the wallpaper, we hung works that he made during that nine-year window. And it was his least, he was incredibly prolific, and this was his least prolific period because he was raising a family and had a full-time job. Is this also the period where he's working in oils as well? Or is that coming a little he, later? It, star it starts here. He had, a f he had a feeling, it's 20s and into the 30s. There's, he made untold thousands of watercolors and what we think maybe 27 oil on canvases because there was this long period where he felt that he couldn't be considered or consider himself a great artist unless it was oil on canvas. Because watercolor is perceived as, as a lesser, a lesser mm. medium, a, mm. a more decorative medium, maybe a feminine medium. Uh, and, and yet the works in oil are amongst, they're probably his least successful. I mean, the Whitney owns several of them, and um, although they're very competent. Yep. That was really not where his um, his he, he could express himself, and I I think what that room shows though is is the distraction and what having to work making wallpaper did mm -hmm. for him. So it's it's very it's it's very interesting in terms of how uh, a story gets told just by placing it on that wallpaper about that particular moment in his in his in his life and in his career and his attitude. Yeah, I mean, sometimes he, when he was, when he was fed up with the work, and sometimes he would call it hack work. But it, it never veered. The wallpapers never veered very far from essential elements in his work, and that they were always nature-based. Mm -hmm. Well, they're very beautiful in their imagery. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're incredibly complex. Yeah, and I'd be curious how you think. Um, and maybe you talk about it later. How you, his making the wallpaper impacted on his work. Well, it. He, he liked to, he was always expanding and cutting back his work. And he would do it by adding paper to the, to the sides and cutting paper away. And he became extremely adept at this technically. So he wasn't installing wallpaper, he was designing it. But that seeming, seeming together of patterns seamlessly is one thing that And we'll get to that a bit later, through. I think, yep. yes. Um, where are we? We're number Next 28. 28. So there are a couple of vitrines in this room. On the left, you had the rollers originally that made the wallpaper. Then these are his wife's scrapbooks of all the work that he did at the wallpaper factory. And then there are a couple of images of him and his wife in his studio. Uh, 29. Uh, this was a, a vitrine that was in the reading room. And on the left are Christmas cards that he designed which Donna says are in the gift shop, which I didn't know that um, that, that happened. They are indeed. I just bought a packet. So <laughs> any of my friends who get my cards will know that that's what they're going to get. And, and it's an interesting story. It's a company that's still in business that started during the Great Depression to uh, help artists make money. And, and they commissioned artists as diverse as Diego Rivera, Stuart Davis, Birchfield, and a, a, a long list of, of artists made Christmas cards. Um, and on the right, uh, we tried to tell a story of a, a bookstore in New York that's kind of been lost. Uh, Birchfield um, 
after Cleveland, going to school in Cleveland, he had a scholarship to go to the National Academy of Design in New York. And he lasted one afternoon and he left. Uh, he stayed two months in New York and he brought, somehow he met these two women, very uh, wealthy, well-connected, very smart women, opened a bookstore that they envisioned as a kind of salon that they would show books of their time, avant-garde literature, and paintings being made at the time on the walls. And they liked each other. They showed uh, his work within the bookstore. They were open for 11 years until 1929. Um, and we think that that's where she, he called he called her, one of the owners of the bookstore, his impresario. And that's how we believe the, the MoMA connection happened, that it was a very small world then that was interested in modern art and that was in New York. And um, one of the owners of the bookstore was best friends with Lily Bliss, who was one of the founders of MoMA. Peggy Guggenheim was an unpaid intern in the bookstore. She would wrap books and deliver them in her furs and her jewels. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so we had a lot of artifacts from the Sunwise Turn bookstore, because it's kind of a, a forgotten but, but, but pivotal moment. And uh, 30. And on the walls in there, we put up um, a lot of his doodles, but it was really tip of the iceberg. He doodled all his life, from the time he was a, a, a teenager until the time he died. And when you're up in the show and you see those doodles, envision that on the back of each one, there's like usually eight to a big card. On the back of each one is a whole other doodle. And then if you turn that big card around, you have the same thing. And this is like, I don't know, how, they don't know how many doodles there are. Like ten, are there ten thousand, eleven thousand? They haven't exactly counted them. So we put a, a huge display of his doodles, and sometimes the the doodles prefigure mm -hmm. motifs that'll happen in painting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they look backwards. They're not dated, so it's hard to tell. When I saw them, I, I mean, I thought a lot about automatic writing mm -hmm. because there really are. There's a very direct kind of relationship with um, you know in the inner states of the mind, and that's where I think this whole. Uh, it's a consistent strain throughout Birchfield's work that in my, I still feel links him back to very early ideas about abstraction. Mm -hmm. These have a, a playfulness about them, but as you've shown with the conventions, they're also ones that are very sinister and very dark, mm -hmm. and, and uh, aside from the imbecility one, which I, you know, I like. But, yeah. um, so I, I think having them in the exhibition really brings that home. <laughs> I'm going to tell an answer. There was another vitrine in that room that I didn't show that had magazines from the mid-30s, Life magazine, a big spread on him, Time magazine, calling him one of America's great painters, and a Fortune magazine. And there was a, we were going through the show, and there was a young man going through the show who was kind of like, he was very good spirited. He was with his watercolor class, I think from Pasadena Community College. And they had come to see the show, and he, he would kind of come into our conversation and go out and he'd say things. And we're looking at this vitrine at the Life magazine, and he gets really excited because he said he thinks he has this Life magazine. And he thinks, he said, I have it. He said, because I collect dopey. And we were like, <laughs> <laughs> like what? And he said, I collect dopey. We said, what are you talking about? And he said, he collects anything related to Dopey from uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Yeah, and, fantastic. And Dopey started in 1936, and so he has that mix. I, I, I told him, I said, you're a true connoisseur. I mean, it's fantastic, really, when you think about that kind of focus to just collect them. I, I don't know. They're probably everywhere. And he also struck me as somebody who maybe had never been in a museum before. Because he was asking us questions yeah, like... Yeah. Um, Very basic kinds of things yeah. about, you know, even the labels and... Yeah. Um, but totally engaged. But see, that's, t to me, then, what makes a successful exhibition. Because, you mm. know, the reality is people who come in who know the work and we study it, and, you know, there's sort of a great myth, in a sense, about, you know, professionals, as if somehow we don't read about the work, or we go to the artist studio, and then you walk in and you're supposed to magically get the work. But, you know, it, it, it spoke to him in some way. And, mm -hmm. and, and in, in, in a way that had nothing to do with the exhibition, but had to do with the whole idea of gathering information and what that information reveals. So I thought that it was quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. It yeah, was. It was a great um, 31. I interestingly have left out a whole room of the show, which was um, the work he became famous for. Yes, I... <laughs> I uh, um, Go yes. Figure. Well, you, when we were going through, you said, you know, you said to me you were, you didn't know how you felt about the f including certain works that weren't your favorite works. Uh, um, but that wouldn't be that 
But there, there's beautiful works in that room, but I can briefly, there, it's what was called American scene painting, and then now we refer to, I think negatively, as regionalism. And they were very straightforward, extremely accomplished watercolors and oil paintings of uh, uh, rural scenes or, or industrial, industrial scenes. Industrial scenes. Some of the industrial scenes are really fantastic. Absolutely. Really fantastic. Yeah, I wish I'd shown there's a piece of black iron. Yeah, that that's amazing. so amazing. That's an amazing one. But it is, it was what Birchfield became known for um, that it was not really where his heart was at. Yeah. I mean, it was, know, it was the 1930s. He was, he knew he was so lucky to be making a living, uh, making art. He was really well rewarded for it, um, both critically and financially. And he had five kids and it's really hard to stop doing something when the world is telling you, is rewarding you for it. Um, but then, uh, America, uh, then Pearl Harbor happened, and uh, America entered uh, World War II. And I often wonder and that if um, America was decidedly isolationist, FDR could not drag, but was trying to drag the country towards an international involvement, but people didn't want to go. And I often wonder about the connection between America's isolationism and its um, embrace of regionalism mm -hmm. in, in art. Mm -hmm. Um, but well, he, I think that's, I think there's a lot yeah. there and, um, you know, but some of the re regionalists were more uh, doctrinaire than others. I mean, John Stuart Curry, right. I mean, if you really go and look at Grant Wood, um, I think there's a lot more going on in Grant Wood than just uh, American regionalist painting. And there's certainly subsequently have been a lot of revisionist histories. Mm -hmm. Wanda Korn, for instance, has done some incredible work looking at, yeah. at Grant Wood. Um, you know, and even looking at Thomas Hart Benton, let's say. But no, you're absolutely right. There was that xenophobia that absolutely clicked with that. And, and also the relationship to figuration. Yeah, yeah. I also think it was a, a reaction against European modernism. Absolutely. Against the, the absurd, the hard to grasp absurdities of Dada and surrealism, maybe even late cubism. Well, there's an incredible document. I think it's more, a little bit later though, maybe 48, 49 by a, a Congressman Dundero, who was then linked with McCarthy during the, in, the uh, Senate hearings and the House Committee on American Activities in which they tried to pass legislation. I came across this once in, in doing some research in a, in a, in a museum archive, uh, passing legislation of, of having artists sign you know, a loyalty oath. But one of the things it talked in there about was that we had to keep these isms from reaching our shores. Huh. So I think you could say surrealism, I mean the isms became the outside of the US uh, yeah. uh, things, or even abstract expressionism in yeah. a sense. Okay, so in 1943, he's turning 50. Uh, the country is in the middle of its involvement of World War II. The sales of his work with the advent of the war have pretty much ground to a halt. Um, uh, and he began to have an artistic crisis. He um, felt that the, the regionalist work that he was doing, even though it was uh, popular, he, he called it libel when um, he was called a, a, an American scene painter. He felt he was capable of so much more, but he was really stuck and, uh, and stalemate. And how he got out of that was, let's, we're gonna come back to this, let's go to 32. He went back to his watercolors from 1917. And what he would do is literally take that watercolor, they were small scale, and paste them onto a much larger board. So the, the work on, the, on that side is um, a 1917 watercolor. We made a reproduction of it and we, we put it on that board. When, when Birchfield died, th that um, conglomeration of four pieces was one piece and it was in his studio unfinished. He had pasted the 1917 watercolor on it and then he had extended the drawing on it and he was gonna make a much bigger composition but it was, uh, he, he never got to it and it was left this way at his death. And um, we believe what happened is that his dealer at the time looked at this and thought, well, what do I do with this? And so they sawed out the 1917 watercolor and sold it but they saved the cut off scraps um, and they were given to the Birchfield Center. And, in, uh, and I was rooting around at the Birchfield Center for some 
visual way within the exhibition to explain this method of reconstructing and making paintings using, in 1943, works from 1917. Mm -hmm. And um, we, they had these three panels, but they had no idea where the watercolor was that was inside of them. And it was my assistant, Becky Kinder, who remembered that we, in our research, that we had seen this in a bedroom on the Upper West Side. And so we were able to borrow it and put the whole thing together and demonstrate how he reconstructed mm. works. So let's go back to 31. Uh, these were the two works that got him out of his crisis, and it was the first time that he took the early works and made them into larger works. And one, one of these is the dates is 1917 to 1943, and the other is 1934 to 43. Of the same scene of two ravines, started at very different times, but finished within a month of each other in 43, and reunited for the first time since they left his studio. Uh, in, the, in this exhibition. And I think they're enormously beautiful uh, and important works within the, um, the, the timeline uh, of his evolution. Um, what is it in particular that you felt was important about these works? Because they really are a collapse of so many things within one. They're very, they're very subject rich, these works. Yeah. Well, one thing is that it gave him, through this reconstructive method, it gave him the tools that led him to the discoveries and accomplishments of his next 20 years. So going back to that language, that early pictographic, which I, I think there's an essay in the catalog that talks about them actually as a pictographic language. Um, I, th I think my take on it is it's not so much the subject matter of the 1917 drawings. I think when he, during 19, that period of 16 to 18, he called it his golden year. Um, at, but it was a time when you're inspired, you know it. And he knew he was inspired. And I think what he wanted in 1943 was to feel inspired again. And by taking back the drawings, I don't think the importance was so much the physical piece of paper as it was trying to get back that experience that he had mm, as, as, mm, a, mm. as a young man. Mm. Well, they're much less self-conscious. And there probably was a level of immediacy within them right. that he would be much harder to capture later on. I mean, it's an interesting, it's, it's very interesting that he did that, that he went back and, and mm -hmm. but again, I mean, I keep harking, uh, going on about the abstraction thing because I, I just find it to be, um, well, we'll come back to that, but the link to modernism to me is still there very strongly. Um, these, what was the reception to these works though when he made them? I think it, I think it was really blank. I mean, he, he said nothing was selling, so he might as well experiment away because uh, nothing, nothing, nothing sells anyway. So, and uh, people weren't really casting an eye on the art world. He was able to, to create in a, not in a vacuum, but in a, without a critical eye being cast mm -hmm. or a financial mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, yep. Oh, this is a, a, a one-off. Uh, so this is another one about Birchfield, the man. The, um, yeah, it, the, the next one over. Oh. You want the leaf. Right, right sorry. Okay. Um, this painting is called The Constant Leaf. He had a lot of physical maladies the last 15, almost 20 years of his life. And he was recovering from something horrible. And he would go to his studio every morning. And all through the winter, this oak leaf remained. And you know, oak leaves don't necessarily deteriorate through the winter. And sometimes they even stay on the trees. And through all Buffalo's wicked winter, the oak leaf was there. And so every morning, this gave him hope that he too would survive. And when he finished the painting, his wife went out and got the oak leaf and framed it and put it aside. And it, it was just a kind of lovely aside about their relationship. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's terrific because the reality is when you read even in his journals and some of the things that have been written, the fact that she, at every step of the way, believed in him and yep. really kept him going. And there's, a, there's always this kind of sense of Birchfield as being either a, 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 a depressed man. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot of discussion, in fact, of his psychic state yeah. in, in both in the earlier texts of Bauer, but I noticed even in some of the uh, uh, criticism or, or reviews of the exhibition, uh, that were uh, written. Doug Harvey. Yes, uh, uh, Doug Harvey's piece, which t attempts to look at you know the uh, his psychic state, um, mm -hmm. connecting it to synesthesia, 
Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting issue, though, of, of whether or not one's looking for a pathology um, to, and naming it in that way, um, which is problematic as well. Uh, but she clearly um, uh, was a, a strong, was a, there was an incredible sense of, of belief there. Absolutely, without, without a doubt, yeah. Um, from reading his journals, I, I would, as a layperson, characterize it maybe as manic depressive because there were periods where he couldn't move, and then when he was on, he was intensely prolific. So. Oh, next. next. So we're into the last 15 years of his life, and I think what we have are a couple of installation shots, and then we'll look at a, from the show upstairs, and then we'll look at uh, some of those close up. 35. Uh, the, the painting in the middle there is called Four Seasons, and he got, um, interested, it started in those 1943 paintings when he was combining things. He also got interested in combining seasons, in different seasons in one painting and different times of day into, into one painting, which I think is a really rich, complex mm -hmm. uh, thing to try to do. Uh, 36, in the center of the room, are Charles Birchfield's journals, which he kept his whole life. He left over 10,000 handwritten pages of journals. Um, the, there's a, I've only read 700 pages because there's a, a edited book of 700 pages of the journals. So when I say I've read the journals, I, I, I've only read that. Um, I thought it was important to put them in the show. It was something I knew I wanted to do also from, from the very beginning because it has a kind of gravitas and weight about recording your time, recording your life, and it almost sends you back to the beginning of the show because there's like two, two there from when he was uh, 15 years old and then two are open that were more contemporary to his time. And then should we talk about the recreations? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The big stacks in the middle, we weren't allowed to borrow from the Birchfield Center because they haven't been transcribed. And they felt that if anything happened to them, something too precious would be lost forever. And so um, uh, two of my assistants went to Buffalo, photographed and measured each of the um, journals and kept notes of how they, took photographs of how they were built uh, we bought the same covers that they used at the Birchfield Center, replicated their labels, then we manhandled them, we put them up on the roof in the sun to bleach them out and make them feel, feel used. And uh, I think it, it says it in the vitrine that they're, what's the what word? What do you say, facsimiles? Facsimiles, yeah. Yes. Okay. So when you say there's no work of mine in the show, there is actually this kind yes. of <laughs> work. Uh, 37. That's fantastic. This painting is called Gateway to September. And, and I think it's literally that. You have a florid summer scene in front, and then this, through this bizarre keyhole shape, you have a kind of a dry September. Um, the, the, the late paintings have a, like a visionary, slightly hallucinatory. Mm -hmm. um, Transcendent? Yes. Tra mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but I think it's interesting looking at that period. This is not, well, this one is 46 to 56. But that idea of the transcendent, you know, which obviously plays out very strongly in abstract expressionism, but here is dealt with in a very different kind of way. Yeah, and predates by 10 years, uh, uh, like an interest in psychedelia. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But they altered states of mind, whatever that means. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things also this uh, you've talked about is this direct observation of nature and even the way in which Birchfield, and there's a, I don't know if you have a slide of the one where with the dandelions, where I he's don't, no. absolutely, you'll see it up in, you'll see it in the exhibition where the dandelions are massive and you really have the sense of him crawling around actually on the ground mm -hmm. uh, in that way. I was thinking a lot about that whole tradition of plein air painting in a sense. Uh, I mean, not that he's, I mean, sometimes he worked out of doors. Oh yeah, he loved to work out of doors yeah. until his health kept him back from it. But then he would work out in his garden, like that painting was done in his garden. I think we're getting the, we're getting we getting the signal. The, okay, this is the last image. Um, and this is a painting that's not in the exhibition. We couldn't get it. It was really hard to get loans for this show. But it will be in the exhibition at the Whitney. They would lend it to, to one venue, but not to the, not to the Hammer. And it's called um, Autumnal Fantasy. And I can't wait to see it, frankly. And, uh, and interestingly enough, it was the one that um, I found a, a very funny quote um, 
uh, about autumnal fantasy is in the Bauer book where, uh, and this was after that time when Birchfield had, had stopped making the regional, quote unquote, regionalist works. And a collector looked at this and said, People will ask if you've cut off your ear after that painting. <laughs> so, you know, even then there was this resistance to accepting Birchfield's uh, very uh, rigorous pursuit of, of, of a language, of mark making, mm -hmm. a marks that actually uh, uh, um, translated into emotional feelings, a use of color in that way. And I, I mean, I think this exhibition is going to go a long way toward really uh, resituating Birchfield. We talked earlier about a show that's at the Whitney right now of Georgia O'Keeffe's abstractions and how looking at O'Keeffe's work uh, from the early period, which is roughly around the same period yes. third, in, of, of in 1917, 1913, yep. Yep. that you begin, these artists you think you know, you begin to see in a very, very different way because the more conventional read of things is always the easier one to come. Mm -hmm. uh, th and that's the purpose of, you know, of doing an exhibition um, in the way and in the way that you've done it, um, which is really quite a quite an exceptional exhibition. Thank you, Donna. So I think. Oh, oh, oh. Thanks. <laughs> We're going to take some questions. It's, it's a have. double question. What does automatic writing mean? You mentioned that, and another question was about the uh, Warhol film of the Sunrise Sunset. Um, does it exist? Is it somewhere? Um, well, the automatic writing was a st uh, uh, something practiced by the surrealists as a way of really having a very direct line to the unconscious. They also did things like the exquisite corpse where someone would draw one picture, fold it up, give it to the next person. They would add something not knowing what the other person had done or things like decalcomania, which was a, a, a technique where you could blot paper and things happen through chance. Um, so there were various strategies and techniques that were principally used during that period. And as, again, I don't think that's what Birchfield called them. That was my characterization. Um, the Warhol film actually uh, uh, does exist. There is a, um, something written about it in Kelly Angel's Catalogue Raisonné of the Films. Um, so I refer you to that. I don't know if it's been archived. Uh, uh, which is a bit of uh, the problem. And so it, it hasn't, uh, well, actually it has been shown. It has some problems to it. Uh, and so I don't think it's been shown since. But if you refer to the catalog resume of Warhol Films by Callie Angel, uh, published by Abrams, you will see an explanation of it. Uh, Robert, I'd love to ask you how much uh very specific uh, involvement as a curator in the art world uh, influenced your art making is the first question. <laughs> yeah, it brings it to a halt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take this as an answer. <laughs> very profound one. And I just want to compliment you on a very selfless way of being involved because I guess it's very tem tempting to insert yourself as an artist in the exhibition. And in that respect, I just wonder if you know the installation done by for LACMA Museum by Jorge Parda, who was commissioned to do this installation of pre-Columbian art. I haven't seen it. You no. haven't seen it? No. Because it's one of the examples when the artist did a very good job, but impose himself so much that it's more about Jorge Pardo and less about the mm -hmm. collection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do, do oh, oh no, uh, you'll be I, next. Is that okay? Uh, I very much... Wait one sec, we'll have this one then. Oh, okay. 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 Yes? I very much enjoyed this exhibition, I think, beautifully installed and curated. Um, when I came into the first room of the 1917 paintings and I was looking at the grandmother, um, I was immediately struck by Matisse and the sort of formal um, composition of it and the sense of light and shadow in the window. And then I was blown away by the uh, photograph in the vitrine of him standing behind Matisse. But that was fantastic. Thanks. I'm looking at the last pictures that were shown 
his 15, last 15 years. Uh, it just occurred to me that I think there's a show somewhere in Paris right now about artists, their work, kind of a premonition of their death. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether it's opened or not, mm -hmm. but I have read about mm -hmm. it. I'm not familiar with it. Mm. That is, uh, you know, from Velazquez and, you know, all yes. throughout history, pictures that were produced prior to their death. And I just suddenly saw something there that, you know, such a... How long, how long was it before he died when he made that picture then? Was it I, a considerable period of time? You know, I, the, I don't know, because I wasn't working with that picture. Right, right, It wasn't right, here, so right. the date is, um, is out of my head. It might, mm -hmm. might be as much as 10 years, though. Hmm. But it is a vision in that sense, so what you're talking about. But we don't know if that was his vision before death. We have a question here. Is the entire exhibit going to the Whitney, and, there, and how many new pictures will be there included in the Whitney exhibit? Uh, there's always a little shuffling around. There'll be two, um, two wonderful late paintings, one I showed here mm -hmm. and, and another one that's in, at the Met that couldn't travel because it's starting to flake, but they would send it to the, to the Whitney. Mm -hmm. It just couldn't go boom, boom, boom across, across the country. And then there's a few other smaller substitutions. Okay. That Thank we'll you. I mean, one of the challenges with watercolors is that they are incredibly fugitive. And yeah. um, it's extraordinary, the work, the, the number of pieces you've, you've assembled, and that we'll be able to have a substantial number of yeah. them in New York. Yeah, for those who don't know, like after this exhibition period, the general rule with museums is that that work will go into dark storage for five years and only available to scholars. Um, and for instance, there was a, uh, in New York at the Historical Society, a show of Audubon's watercolors. And after that exhibit, 15 years into dark storage. We have one there, and then we'll go over here. Yes. Oh, I was. Oh, okay. this, this might respond to that. I was curious. The um, reproduction of the wallpaper is so highly saturated compared to the uh, watercolor. Was is that intentional, or is that uh, you know trying to get a read back to the original colors? Well, the originally the wallpaper was done with rollers, but we we recreated it through silkscreen process. And um, silkscreen just is very... More saturated. Uh, yes, yeah, very, very flat and saturated colors. But we did try to stay really close to his gouache study, which is hung on it upstairs. Because actually the 1922 wallpaper um, wa wasn't that close uh, to his original gouache. It was qu uh, quite a bit of... Uh, difference in coloration and texture. I mean, it, the, the Birchfield Penny Center, up until I think the late 70s or so, used to sell yeah. Birchfield wallpaper, um, but they no longer produce it. Um, so people who bought it then, actually, uh, I don't know if they had many different patterns or just one. But Bob and I have met, uh, not met, but we have yeah. a thing over wallpaper because of an exhibition that I did many years ago of called Apocalyptic Wallpaper of artists working with wallpaper. And he first refused to be in the exhibition. She's um, very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> but we spent an afternoon at the Cooper Hewitt actually looking at historic wallpaper, uh, which was a real delight. Um, and the history of wallpaper is a is really fascinating um, from, you know, Proust's talking about the yellow room. I mean, there's really, it's an incredible history within it. So it's, it's not banal and pedestrian at all, even, even if Birchfield didn't like it in the end. I was curious about um, how, how much he was aware of what was going on in Europe and who he was influenced by. Um, I think of Kupka, for example. Mm -hmm. um, how, was, how much relationship did he have with those artists? Fairly limited. I mean, I was surprised. I just put together a list for someone recently of shows he was in in Europe, and it, it was surprising. I thought it was one or two, but it was a surprising number. But most of them would have been group shows, say like 17 Americans, you know, from a from a certain period. But he never traveled to Europe, and like I said, it was once a once a year to New York. It's it's hard to know from reading the 700 pages of the journal. I couldn't answer that question. 
But certainly, you know, during that time of, we were talking earlier about uh, Stieglitz in 291 and, you know, showing DeMuth and Marin, that, that group of, 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 of Prendergast, I mean, that notion, looking at watercolor also as the spirit of modernity. And Cindy Burlingham in her essay talks very, uh, uh, in, in, a, in an incredible way, a, a really a very informative essay where she speaks about that. So I wonder about that. I feel that there's still, there's a mythology, a myth here that um, I myself don't feel I've quite gotten beyond. I mean, what Birchfield talked about in his journals and what he didn't talk about is what's driving things. But the fact that he, his teacher was shown in the Armory exhibition, there were a few slides at the end which I just decided not to show in the end, but what they were, were some of the biomorphic surrealist works of Rothko and Newman. And I was, and Kupka is a, a fantastic reference. I mean, there's, there's a lot there that, but it's hard to talk about because Birchfield himself didn't speak about it. So it has to be purely interpretive in a sense. Or going back and looking at the exhibitions Birchfield was in, uh, which again, Cindy talks about in, in that whole uh, moment in terms of uh, going back to Winslow Homer. Were you aware, Bob, of any religious background or his relationship to the transcendent, where that came from, or uh, transcendentalism? In terms of religion, he had a, a, a um, he had a fiery preacher grandfather, and he grew up with an, a, a real aversion to organized religion and uh, described himself as agnostic until this crisis period uh, when he was turning 50. And then he converted to Lutheranism, which his wife was always an active participant in the Lutheran church. Hardly an ecstatic religion. Um, <laughs> and from, from uh, uh, Cindy and I visited his house in, in Buffalo. Uh, it's not preserved, somebody else. Uh, lives there, but we trespassed around in the snow and 10 degrees below zero. But it's, it's re still relatively rural and isolated, but there's a number of nearby houses, and maybe three away is the Lutheran church. And he lived there 50 years. He was very much a man of his community, and I see it rather than as like an extreme religious conversion, but becoming part of a community and looking towards the end of his life, uh, uh, f f towards spiritual questions. But his relationship with transcendentalism, I don't know, it's brought up a lot um, uh, in the writings about his work, mm. but I, I can't speak from, from him. You know what we didn't talk about at all is just his love of music. Oh, yeah. And that relationship with, you know, the whole visual music and music yeah. as an abstract language and yeah. his interest in Scriabin and, and Wagner and... Sibelius, he's crazy Sibelius. about Sibelius, so I got Sibelius CDs to listen to. I <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't go. That's probably why we're not talking about music. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question here in the center. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question. You mentioned um, his facility with watercolors as opposed to oils. And it brought to mind the, the habit that some artists have of doing studies in watercolors because they're easier than oils. So I'm wondering how much of the artist's schooling had to do with, with that leaning towards watercolors more than oils. As you know, they're easier to pull off. Maybe maybe he did a hundred of them in one day. Mm -hmm. and maybe that's what he stuck with. Is there anything in his schooling background that that would have led him down that path? I honestly don't know. He did talk about the uh, he liked that with watercolor. I read something where he he said he loved that. You could just erase it, and, st and 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 there are some works in the exhibition. I think maybe the um, is it the one with the Milky Way? Uh, well, I know there are some where there's mm -hmm. actually the paper is almost abraded; it's yeah. rubbed off. Right, and, but I don't know vis-a-vis -vis yeah. schooling. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that aspect of it. Could you talk about his education a little bit? Well, uh, went to the Cleveland Institute of Art. Um, had some teachers like uh, Mr. Keller who were uh, pretty advanced in what the, both what they did and what they knew. He was, uh, uh, Birchfield was a, a big fan of uh, Japanese woodcuts, Chinese scroll painting, but also um, il illustrators. Um, 
whose name is slipping my mind right now, um, because he thought that he would be uh, training as an illustrator um, um, to make schooling useful for having a job. And it was only maybe towards the very end or when he got out that he decided he was going to go towards more being an artist than an illustrator. And during that time, he was also torn between being a, uh, a nature writer or uh, a nature illustrator. We have time for one last question. Do you know, was there anything about his life that would have induced um, hallucinogenic scenes like he painted? You mean like, did he take drugs? <laughs> Why grains? I would be very surprised if, um, if he took drugs. Although he did take a lot of different medications for his problems, and he was on steroids for a long time. I mean, the list of his medical problems, he had low blood pressure, so he was dizzy all the time. He had attacks of asthma. He had what they called lumbago, is that? Um, he had bleeding ulcers. He had terrible prostate, uh, prostate problems and repeated operations on the prostate. He had a heart attack 10 years before he died of a heart attack. And it kind of goes in, oh, diabetes. And so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that was the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, everyone.